Our guest today took his 15th ranked team to the Sweet 16. He is now the head coach at Wichita State. He's back on the show. He's Coach Paul Mills, and he joins us next. Welcome to the Unpacking It podcast, where we unpack sports, faith, and life with intriguing guests from the sports and entertainment world. Today's guest is Coach Paul Mills, and this is a special interview edition of the podcast, our normal devotional-based Tuesday show episode uh, will return next week but wanted to share this special interview with you today. And throughout the fall, we'll also add some other interviews uh, to the weekly rotation of podcasts. And so thank you for listening to all of our podcasts, including the Fantasy Football Fellowship podcast, as well as the Unpacking It Minute. And so all of our shows can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts, as well as uh, you can check out our YouTube channel, at Unpacking It, and at Fantasy Football Fellowship. So, on today's show, we will talk a little college basketball. We've been all in on football, but guess what? The season is about to begin. We got the NBA starting up as well, so it's a wild time of the year as we uh, we juggle all the different sports. As you listen to today's show, we always appreciate when you like and share and rate, review, so we appreciate all of your support, and this is the Unpacking It golf tournament season and so we are we are fired up about the ninth annual unpacking it golf tournament and if you would like to support our efforts as a ministry and and especially uh, support the event uh that we did on the 21st uh we greatly appreciate you going to unpackingit.com slash donate and and you can click golf tournament to specifically support our our latest fundraising efforts and it allows us to continue to offer you podcasts and devotionals and fantasy football fellowship. And so thank you so much for your support. We also want to thank the support of Upward Sports uh, as a sponsor here on the podcast. You can check out upward.org slash unpack and start a sports ministry at your church. Find out how you can do it and, and, and learn more about Upward and all the different sports that they offer basketball, cheerleading, soccer, flag football, volleyball, baseball, and soccer. And also in the coming weeks, they will begin to offer Upward Running. Uh, so we'll, we'll let you know more about that soon. But when you partner with Upward Sports, your church can reach the community, attract young families, and share the gospel. And so Upward Sports, they customize your sports outreach strategy to support your church, the budget, the community needs in your area, and it's it, they know that you know one size doesn't fit all, so it's customizable to make it work for you. So again, check out upward.org/unpack. All right, so today's guest is Coach Paul Mills. He was a longtime Baylor assistant with Coach Scott Drew. Then he got the opportunity to go to Oral Roberts, and so he did a tremendous job, really building that program up. And then in 2021, they were the 15th ranked team at Oral Roberts. They went to the Sweet 16 by upsetting Ohio State and Florida. I mean, that was a huge run. That's one of the great Cinderella stories in college basketball, March Madness history. And then they ended up losing a tough one to Arkansas, uh, which they had a shot to get to the Elite Eight. And so we had Coach Mills on back in 2021. So check out that episode as well. Uh, shares his testimony. Really cool story because... He was a former kind of agnostic. He, he grew up, his dad was a pastor, really wrestled with his faith, and then God revealed himself and made it clear that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did die, rise again, and he is our Savior. And so that that conversation was on our last episode, uh, but today we're going to catch up with him because now he's the head coach at Wichita State. So he's heading into his second season as the head coach of the Shockers, and they've had a, a rich basketball history, great program there. Uh, and so he uh, he took over back in 2023 after spending six years at Oral Roberts. And so right now, let's jump in. And right now, we are thrilled to welcome back Coach Paul Mills here on Unpacking It. But this time, 
He's the head coach at Wichita State. Uh, he's heading into his second season. Coach, it's great to have you back on. How are you doing? Bryce, great to be here. Very kind of you to have me on again. Uh, uh, time flies. I'm, you said 2021 was the last time I was on. So it, uh, it, it, a lot has changed. Absolutely. So I, I want to hear all about the, the the journey to Wichita State. But but first, you're you're heading into your second season, and so I'm just curious, how different is the 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 mindset? How do you feel compared to this time last year when you were heading into your first year? Yeah, I, I think any time that you do something new, you're kind of unfamiliar with it. Uh, you have an idea about how you think things will go. We we all have dreams and and aspirations about the way that we want this stuff to play out and rarely does it go uh there are occasions i think my friend jerome tang at kansas state has ruined it for a lot of first year coaches people just think you go to the elite eight after being somewhere for one year but you know the the mantra that i've used is elevators do not get to the penthouse immediately uh there are levels to this and one of the things that happens when you take a new job is, you know, the first thing you do is you go into the locker room and you ask how many of you guys plan on being here, plan on staying. And let's say seven hands go up. And in your mind, you immediately think to how do we complete this roster? I need to go get six new guys uh, in order to, to get the 13 man roster. But the truth is, is you do not know the seven guys who volunteered to, to stay. And, and so that there's a lot of learning, not only on the new players that are coming in, but the players who decided to, to stay. And I think through that whole process that you kind of learn about the league, the caliber of player that's required in order to be competitive, but there's a learning of your team. And I feel like in year number two, you know much better uh, the foundation, the people that you have, uh, in-house and in your locker room in order to build this thing in a way that you're now mindful of to be competitive in your conference. That That's a great perspective. It makes sense. And so here you go, year number two. What what has you excited and, and, and how you feeling about this year's team? Yeah, one, we have depth. Uh, you know, we only ended up playing seven guys a year ago. And I think through the course of the season, that, that kind of takes a toll. Two, I, I would tell you that... Uh, there's experience. Anybody who's been around you, they're probably going to be a better year number two than year number one because, you know, they understand the demands. They understand the standards. Uh, they understand your values. And so all of that being a part of it, I just think that uh, players being equipped with more knowledge about, man, I'm just telling you, Coach Mills is not going to give on this particular issue. And it, it, the standard is the standard, and we need to find a way to live up to it. So I, I think all of that plays a part. We only had three transfers uh, from, from our team. Uh, the average in our conference was eight. Uh, there were several uh, teams in our league that had double digits, a lot of that due to a coaching change. But I think to return five of our top seven from a year ago definitely helps and feel great about the pieces that we've been able to add. Love it. Love hearing that. That's great. So let's go back then. So you had a wonderful career at, at Oral Roberts as, as their head coach, and, and you took them to really unbelievable heights and a deep tournament run a few years ago, and which was incredible. And then you got this opportunity to go to Wichita State. So take us into the process and the decision-making and, and really you know, how God led you and, and guided you to, to ultimately say yes to going to Wichita State. Yeah, you know, one of the things that happens when you're successful is you get some other opportunities. And I, I know after our Sweet 16 year in 2021, you know, there were some opportunities to go to other places, but just never felt that those situations were the right fit. Uh, to be honest with you, every single year that I was at ORU, even during a bad year, uh, <laughs> Uh, be, because of my experience at Baylor and the success that we had had there, um, there were always phone calls and, and people who were asking if I would be interested in making a change. And, you know, during my last year, uh, we were able to win 30 games. It was the most in the Division One era that ORU had ever won. 
um, ha had a number of really good players and just felt that in this NIL era that you need to be at a place that one is equipped to, to handle it. Um, people, unfortunately, if you're not equipped to handle it just because the landscape is changing, uh, this is a different game than what it was just five years ago and had opportunities just besides Wichita State, but I was very familiar with the passionate fan base. There's a rich history here. Just 10 years ago, this was an undefeated team. They were 34-0, uh, 35-0 and 0, uh, before they lost in the NCAA tournament, um, 11 years removed from a Final Four. And I knew how passionate the people were here and felt like this was a situation where that like I want I want to be involved in a final four. Uh, I, I want to coach a team. Uh, I want to be at a place where there's aspirations for a final four. And so this was a place that had done it. Um, and it was very attractive. It was only about two and a half hours from where I previously was in Tulsa. So regionally, it made sense. The recruiting landscape made sense and felt a great deal at peace about uh, the decision and the opportunity here. I love it. And and I was looking at your, uh, your, your Twitter feed and you, you, you retweeted a couple different things that jumped out to me. One, the home crowd is considered one of the, the top 10 atmospheres in college basketball, which is incredible. And then also the logo, the, which the, the shockers logo, it was ranked number one. So, so <laughs> you guys got some cool, you know, just some, so the, the atmosphere and, and being a part of that share with our listeners kind of what, you know, just for me, even going, oh, wow, okay, cool. What do we need to know about Wichita State and kind of the program and the school? Yeah, yeah. So if you look, uh, Kansas is the second largest producer of wheat in the country. North Dakota is actually number one, but Kansas is second. So you're not going to drive far uh, without seeing a farm. Uh, this is a very blue-collar uh, state. It's a blue-collar city. Uh, we had people who showed up to our Midnight Madness event, and I, I probably counted at least half a dozen people in overalls. Uh, and my guess was they came straight from their wheat farm. So a shocker uh, is somebody who gathers wheat and they stick it in a bundle. So a bundle of wheat is called a shock of wheat. So people who uh, are shockers, they are the people who go and bundle all of that wheat. So uh, about an acre uh, of, of wheat uh, is going to produce about 120 loaves of bread. And so uh, you get an idea about all of the bread that spread out ac across. So you can imagine all of the wheat fields and all of the things that, that need to get done. So this is a very, Wichita is the largest city in Kansas. Uh, it's the 50th largest city in America. And this is a very blue collar town. And, and because there is no football at Wichita State, mm -hmm. people pay attention to basketball all 12 months of the year. And people talk about it. If we have a recruit on campus, they're usually on the front page of the Wichita Eagle. Uh, people pay a great deal of attention. I, 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 I remember early, I was here for about a week and walked into a local gas station and was stopped and asked to take a number of photos and sign some things. And, and I was like, yeah, this is different. Uh, this isn't anything that, that I had really experienced before. And so people care a great deal um, about basketball here. Kansas is a basketball state. Uh, when I was at Baylor, I always thought like, man, you know what? If we ever get to become number one in the country, um, people will show up. Uh, because we were only getting four to 5,000 a game. And we got to number one, and we may have gotten 7,000 a game. And I just realized Kansas is a state that's dominated by football. Uh, Oklahoma, I thought, was similar. I believe the last game there, we had a little bit north of 8,000. Uh, but my first few years uh, <laughs> there at ORU, I mean, we were lucky if we could get 100 um, who, who were in the building and, and just built that thing over time. But I knew that this wasn't a situation where we just add water, but I will tell you that um, it, it, it is a place where people absolutely love the Shockers. And I think what anybody wants to see when you go on the court, you went to your job today and you worked hard and you were prepared and you were diligent about what you were asked to do. 
I think that's what people want to see when they come to a basketball game. They want to see representation. Hey, I showed up today and I did my job and I did it with passion and I was responsible about the things that I was asked to do. They want to see that out of the young men who are there in that particular city. Are they showing up? Are they doing this hard? Are they doing it with passion? And I, I think the people really support that. And I know that they do here uh, in Wichita. That's neat. Gosh, I, I, I got to get to a game out there. That sounds fun. Come um, on, anytime, Bryce. Well, well, you guys are actually in the same conference as Charlotte. So we're in Charlotte. So I, I might have to sneak okay. over and, uh, and see you guys when, when you come to town. But yeah. Um, but uh, but no, so so I'm I'm fascinated though with with the the atmosphere and, and sort of the culture there. It's a basketball town. Well, with that comes some expectations, some pressure. Absolutely. How how have you learned throughout your coaching career to uh, to handle those things? And even for people listening today that that battle their own you know pressure and expectations and, and all that, what have you learned in that regard? Yeah, I, I will tell you one. Pressure is a privilege. Uh, it, it's it's good to have expectations. Um, it's good to be at a place where people expect a lot out of you. One, they're, they're probably, it's probably a tribute to the fact that they believe that you're capable. And then the second thing is, uh, uh, you know, that you're able to actually fulfill whatever it is you're, you're asked to do. So I, I do think that you have to kind of think through the balance. Uh, the ability to say no is pretty important, but you know, there, there was a famous um, New York Jets uh, was where he played the majority of his career, if not his entire career. But he was a cornerback named Darrell Revis. And 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 he was one of the finest quarterbacks. And I remember I listened to him one time and he said, when I go out on a field, you either feel pressure or you apply pressure. And I remember thinking, you know what? That's what I want to do. I, I don't want to necessarily feel I want to be so engaged in the moment that whatever the task is before me, that I want to be able to apply pressure. And so I would tell you, you know, uh, given the fact that this is a Christ-centered program uh, that, that we have here on this podcast, I would tell you that for a Christian, uh, me being a Christian, that if we're going to run around and say we represent Christ, whether it be in the educational field, in the law field, in the medical field, whatever particular field that we're called to, to represent Christ, I would ask, like, how good do you think you should be at what you're doing? Uh, if you're going to run around saying you're God's representative, I, I would tell you that you need to be pretty good, uh, that you need to be prepared, that you need to be diligent, uh, that you need to have high expectations, because at the end of the day, you're representing something that's way bigger than you. And so I really do consider pressure to be a privilege. And in my mind, hey, with the expectations, I get all of that. I understand it. But my job is to apply pressure to make sure I'm being diligent in whatever the task is in front of me. That's cool. That's a, that's a unique perspective. I like that. And a little Darrell Darrell Revis uh, shout out former uh, former corner. Oh player. man, he was pretty good. He was <laughs> Revis Island. That's that's for sure. Well, well, of course we we love talking uh, faith here on on unpacking it, and and so uh, appreciated. Last time you were on, you shared your testimony, and so encourage people to to check that out uh, on unpackingit.com. But but let let's kind of dive in and unpack kind of where you're at in your your spiritual journey and and maybe some things that that God has been teaching you recently and and things that maybe you're you're studying or learning and I know that the the, the season's about to get going and time starts to to get tight but but how have you invested time with the Lord and in what ways uh, are you growing? Yeah, I mean there's there's not a day that goes by that I'm not in Scripture. Uh, it's important to me. Awesome. I don't know how many people have an app, uh, but usually when I'm driving around, I usually listen to Psalms 119, um, one, because it's long, and I can usually uh, get that drive. You can probably only get through about 60 verses, but I, I, I listen to uh, a lot of scripture in my car. Uh, I, I do listen to um, a, a number of people who, from a podcast perspective, pastors who uh, I think a great deal of, but I, I would tell you that scripture is important. And so when, when I look at second Timothy three sixteen, right. And, and it says, Hey, listen, all scripture is God breathed 
and it's profitable. And it, it's profitable. It mentions four things there, teaching, training, correcting, and rebuking. And I, I think any time that we hear that, we are like, man, I know some people I need to teach. I know some people I need to train. I need to correct. I need to rebuke. But in my mind, it's like, you know what? This scripture is done to teach me. Mm. Uh, it's done to correct me. It's done to rebuke me. Uh, and because there are not areas in my life that, that I'm perfect. And so there are areas that, that I need to tighten up. And so the, the place that scripture holds in that, uh, you know, I think it was John Piper who said, don't tell me that, uh, uh, God is silent uh, when you haven't opened your Bible. Mm. Um, we know that God uses his word in order to speak to us. I also think about the verse just prior, verse 15 of 2 Timothy. And Paul, right before he heads to the guillotine, uh, reminds Timothy that remember where you learn this stuff. Um, remember it was from your mother, and Lois, and from your grandmother, Eunice. Uh, that was where you learned this stuff. And, and he talks about the conviction that they had that the the one of the best apologetics in the world, in my opinion, is it is modeled by people that you love. And, and Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy, man, you saw this on a day-by-day -day basis in your home. Mm -hmm. You saw your mother, uh, how convicted she was to go through with this. You saw it from your grandmother. And, and I think that sometimes we can read a bunch of words or we can think, but we need to see it modeled. And, and scripture has its place, obviously. Um, the, the way that the people of God uh, become more like the Son of God is through the Word of God, uh, by the power and conviction of the Spirit of God. And so we know that this occurs, but the way that it occurs and the best apologetic that, that we can have is we need to model this stuff for other people once we've been in the Word, as, as Paul tells Timothy. And so for me, I, I just think through on a daily basis on account of where I fall short. Uh, sometimes it could be uh, in, in my language at practice. Uh, and, and you, man, you know what? I got way too angry uh, about that situation and I didn't handle that right. And I think what a Christian needs to model is repentance. Um, you know, the one reason that I believe that, that David is called a man after God's own heart is when David is confronted by Nathan, uh, over his sin, he says, I'm guilty. Uh, whereas so many people, when they're confronted by their sin, they make an excuse for it. And I think that any time that we model it, one, we need to make sure we're pointing uh, to the person that we should be modeling. And it's not necessarily me. Um, and But we also need to make sure that we have this heart uh, that desires a, a following of God in our day in and day out activity. And it's going to come by how we model this. Gosh, that's powerful. That's really good. And and, and along with that, I'm curious kind of your uh, principles or, or key characteristics of, of Jesus that, that you want to represent as a coach that maybe you, you emphasize or, or continue to bring up and, and, and talk about modeling. What are some of those key things that you think come out as, as a coach? Yeah, I, I would one, I, I would tell you love needs to be preeminent. Right. Um, uh, I, I go back to the first John three eighteen verse. Uh, love is not done with word or with speech. It's done in actions and in truth. Uh, it, if anybody can say anything, uh, people can make whatever claims they want to make. But at the end, we figure out if people genuinely love through their actions. Uh, we, we can kind of get past the words we figure out if people love through them being treating us honestly, them being honest with us. I go back to a quote I heard many years ago that uh, genuine love does not enable bad behavior. Uh, genuine love confronts it. If you know that somebody is headed in a direction that is not going to be um, beneficial for them, you're, you're going to tell them that it's not going to be beneficial for them. And so how it's modeled for me is one, I, I need to treat our players honestly. Uh, I don't need to say one thing and then do something else. Um, and th and it, it needs to be, man, you know what, if Coach Mills says it, I'm telling you, he's going to follow through on it. 
and and they and they need to be what whatever it is that that we see at that particular moment it needs to be honest the best thing that i can do for a player is to treat them honestly uh players and their families know the decisions that are best for them but they only know the decisions that are best for them when they're armed with the truth and th- and i feel like that's my responsibility the second thing is i just can't talk about this stuff um, there, there has to be actual actions behind this. So I, I would tell you that preeminent abo- above everything is, is love needs to be demonstrated. I, the, the second thing is, is we know, uh, so love is truth, uh, per first John three eighteen. We know John 1 14 says that, that Jesus is the epitome, not only of truth, but he is the epitome of grace and, and this ability to extend grace, uh, because you are teaching 18, 19, 20, mid 20 year old or early 20 year olds. You're teaching them. They're not going to get it right. Um, and, and I don't get it right. Uh, now in my fifties, I don't get it right. And so I, I feel like, man, I need to model grace. Um, and I don't know, just be, be, be transparent. I don't do a great job of this. <laughs> I hear you. And, yeah. uh, but I, I do need to model love, um, and and we talk about that quite a bit. Um, and and to be honest with you, it's important to me that that it goes beyond the words, though, that it be demonstrated. And as as best as we can, we need to make sure that grace is involved in this whole process. Amen. Grace and love; those are those as powerful as it gets. So uh, I love hearing just a little bit about kind of your your approach as a as a coach and. And it's clear that you've you've been called to to be a coach, and, and God has designed you uh, uniquely to to do that. I, I was reading another interview that you did years ago, and and the question was what drives you, and and you said your calling, and and you went on to, to answer. But but I'm curious for for people today listening, and you know we're talking to sports fans, they might be wrestling with what is my calling, what is my purpose, what is my 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 meaning in in life. What have you learned in that regard, and, and how does your calling drive you day in, day out? Yeah, uh, I'll answer the second question first, but, you know, I think callings are holy things. Um, like, you've been designated to do something uh, that you feel that you've been equipped to do. You know, I, I share with our players often that God doesn't make everybody six foot eight. Uh, you've been given something very few people have actually given. And so we want to get the most out of this God given ability uh, while we can. And so I do feel that whatever your calling is, um, that that one, you, you pursue it uh, and, and you pursue it in the right way. I, I, I remind our players of this, that, you know, it. We, we can navigate a lot of different spaces, um, but we will uh, reap the things that we're sowing. Mm. And we need to make sure that we're headed down a path that we know is going to allow us to be honoring, in my opinion, of what God has equipped us with. Uh, we need to find ourselves, as the Apostle Paul says, uh, we need to make sure that we are worthy of the calling that's, that's been placed on our lives. And so for me, it needs to show up and, and demonstrate itself in a variety of ways. How do we find our calling? Um, I, I would tell you that uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll wrote a particular book called, uh, a fantastic book called The Mystery of God's Will. Mm. And I, I thought that was wonderful for me at that particular juncture in my life. And, and I think that we need to pursue uh, the will of God. There are certain things that we know about what we're called to do. For instance, me as a dad, me as a husband, uh, I, I, I know what my responsibilities are there. But I think that any time that we pursue our calling, I think people are uniquely wired. We are all wired differently. And I think that internally, we kind of understand how we're wired and the things that we need to do. And, and I would just tell you that, man, the things that, you know, like when that song comes on the radio and you're motivated by it, um, assuming that that it's a God honoring song, uh, uh, assuming that it's a God honoring call it, I, I would lean wholeheartedly into that and pray about that stuff. And I think that when you can gather a piece like, man, this is this is the path that I feel that that I'm being fulfilled by working uh, on account of, of what God has equipped me with internally. 
I think that any time that you can go down that path, I do feel like, man, that that is the calling of God on your particular life. And and again, there's some people, whether it be um, Chuck Swindoll, The Mystery of God's Will, uh, there are some wonderful resources out there that I really think can help people comb through that. But it's all going to eventually point back to Scripture. Amen. No, it's, it, that sounds like a very intriguing book. So I, I made a note of that. So that, I'll have to check that out. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 that, that ranks high on my list of books. Yeah. What, what else do you throw on that list off the top of your head? What are some of your top favorite books? Yeah. Uh, one, I, I, I'm at a point now to where but books are great. Uh, I'm not telling you that, they, that, that they're not. But I am at a point now to where um, I, I find myself uh, listening uh, to a lot more just because of the busyness of time. But I don't think you could go wrong with anything Chuck Swindoll. I do not think you could go wrong with anything A.W. Tozer uh, and 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 John Piper. I think them three, A.W. Tozer, John Piper, and Chuck Swindoll, uh, you could probably grab any book off the shelf and you'll find yourself uh, – Whatever the subject is that you may be struggling at that time, I think you'll find yourself immersed in something that God has actually helped those guys write for the people at that particular time. It's good stuff. Yeah, I, I went back a little bit recently through through uh, John Piper's Don't Waste Your Life because I read it years ago but yeah. was, was looking through that again. Some of the highlights from the first time around. So, uh, the good. Desiring God, um, or, or, I mean, he, he he's done a, a – just a remarkable job of challenging Christians. Amen. Absolutely. All right. So you mentioned being a, being a dad, and in the last time uh, that you were, you joined us, we we share the girl dad distinction, which is wonderful. And so your girls are a little older than mine. Mine are mine are three and five now. Uh, oh yeah, two years a, apart, like, like your your girls. So how are they doing? And and what is this season of life for you as a dad? What's kind of your role lately? And the the uh, yeah, what what's on the on the uh, the I don't know, the radar, I guess. Yeah, you know what? My dad, when I was dropped off at college, set me down and he said, he said, son, I want you to know I'll always love you. Uh, but he says the relationship kind of shifts now. Uh, you're becoming your own man. And I'm more friend uh, than, than I am dad. Mm. And and so through this whole process, I'm here. Don't want you to ever think that I'm not. But you're going to navigate your own path. And it's kind of like we encourage children to to navigate their own faith. You know, we have ours, uh, but you need to go through this process of your own. So I have a 19 year old who's now a sophomore in college and I have a 17 year old uh, who is in her senior year of high school. And uh, she she's not there yet. But I will tell you, I'm a year away from being an empty nester. And I would tell you that, you know, those times hey, five and three are such fun ages. And and you're going to hear this and it's almost going to sound cliche, but I, I can't encourage moms and dads to pour into their children because there does come a time when the relationship shifts. I remember when my oldest went off to college, I heard somebody say 92% of the time you've spent with your daughter is already done. Oh, and wow. it was like, man, you know what? For the rest of my life, I'm only going to get 8% of her time uh uh where we the the vast majority of it's done and the what what i've realized is there are things that we do in our family for us sunday afternoon dinners are are pretty important mm. uh to where we gather as a family and and go through that process but i i would tell you just uh man don't cut that time short uh invest um i had a number of people who invested in me uh as a dad and any time that you can find ways uh to man could could i could i come in late uh to work in order to attend the volleyball game uh i i would just tell you that stuff goes a long long way and i i really prioritize uh my children's schedule uh even with the busyness of college basketball and now I'm at a different phase in life, but they're, they're both doing great. They both love Jesus, and it's, a, it's an honor and true privilege to be their dad. Ah, that's awesome. Where, where's your daughter at school for college? She's at Oklahoma State. So oh, okay. one of the things that happens when you grow up in Tulsa, which she did for six years, is you either get indoctrinated to become a Sooner uh, or, or a Cowboy at Oklahoma State. So uh, she, she ended up going to Oklahoma State. Uh, before we moved here. 
Gotcha. Okay. So then your other daughter moved with you a couple years ago in, in yeah. high school. How, how was that? Yeah, uh, that's a transition. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think any time that you get children of when, when we first moved from Waco, Texas to Tulsa, uh, my children were 12 and 10 at the time, and uh, they're just along for the ride. You know, I, I think any time that there's transitions during high school, uh, it's not easy. But she's she's been a she's handled it well. She has great friends. She's made a great community. And even we're we're only two and two hours and change from Tulsa. Uh, she still has her friends come up here. She gets down there. So she's navigated this process as best as you possibly can. That's awesome. Yeah, because you know we hear about coaches changing and moving, and and the the families. Hopefully go with you. So that's uh, that's always oh, part of the man. deal. I can't tell you how many coaches told me, do not take a job before your child's senior year. Ah. Like the uh, like that change, uh, they, they talked about the ramification. And that's always stuck in my brain uh, during, during that whole process is, is I was going to make decisions that I thought were best for my family, mm. regardless of whatever the monetary benefit may be. Mm. That's great. That's good. Good encouragement for all of us to consider for sure. Well, man, coach, this was this was a blast, and and so thankful to to have you you, you back on the show. And uh, man, just excited for the start of college basketball. And and I guess we'll kind of end on this. Uh, this is probably the the least I don't know important, but the state of college basketball is is just been fascinating. So I'm always curious, different people, you know, opinions on on where we stand because I'm a, I'm a longtime college basketball fan, but it has changed drastically in the last couple of years but at the but at the core of it hey we still have March Madness we still have incredible games all season long but what have you made of just sort of all these changes and how have you adapted and adjusted and embraced the NIL and transfers and and everything else yeah you do you have to think ahead uh I mean I I can remember at, at Baylor thinking you know what this process would look like in two or three years and then obviously at Oral Roberts I think it was uh a pretty big change that occurred with NIL um, in, in that process. And even just a year ago, you know, before you weren't allowed to talk to potential recruits about NIL, now you are. Uh, yesterday, things changed. There used to be a national letter of intent uh, that is now done away with. Uh, there, There's just things that, that are constantly moving. And I think NIL is, is, is on account of the the settlement, I think it's April 7th, 2025 is when that's going to be settled. It, it's going to change again. It's going to begin to move in house. But I, I think you have to be you have to stay ahead of it. You know, um, yeah, you have to talk to your colleagues quite a bit uh, about what is going on. And you do have to stay a step or two ahead. And you do have to think proactively. You, you have to think like, all right, we're, we can't get caught behind on this while trying to figure out how to navigate some of these changes. So there are a lot of phone calls uh, with Indianapolis, which is where in NCAA is, and a lot, a lot of phone calls with the NABC, National Association of Basketball Coaches, board members, uh, and getting an idea about what, what's on the forefront. But I, I do think some of these changes are, have, have been beneficial, but I do feel bad for fans simply because the days of a freshman coming in and you watch any Fred Van Fleet now plays for the Houston Rockets. Yeah. He was here as a freshman, uh, and then, you know, he, here he is as a senior, and fans get to kind of grow. I think those days may be gone. Uh, but uh, it, it's 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 interesting landscape, and we need to stay ahead of the curve. That's a good good thought. Absolutely, yeah. Fred Van Vliet, what a, his rise as well. So he's a he's a shocker. He's uh, he's a shocker. One of the, one of the he's a shock. One of the legends. So well, you're yes. you're you're coaching the the next group of legends coming from Wichita State, and so we'll be we'll be pulling for you guys and excited for uh, for the start of another season, year number two as the, uh, the head coach at Wichita State. So, so, Coach Paul Mills, thank you so much for joining us today here on Unpacking It. Bryce, thank you. Absolutely. He's Coach Paul Mills. For Aaron, I'm Bryce. I'm a sports fan who follows Jesus. I believe in the good news that he died on the cross for my sin. He was resurrected, and through faith, I've been saved by his grace. I hope that is true for you as well, and I hope you'll join me as we live life as sports fans who follow Jesus together. Have a great rest of your day, and we will talk to you next time right here on the Unpacking It Podcast.